So to start off, I'm actually going to de demonstrate the opaque and transparent colours. It's important that you understand that distinction because otherwise you would tend to use a colour um, for the wrong reason. So with an opaque colour, you will obliterate, say, another colour beneath it. As an example here, we have yellow ochre. So I take a little bit of yellow ochre and say I have a portrait that I've played around with before. If I put a bit of yellow ochre just across any section of the painting, you'll see that it basically takes out any of the colour beneath it, whether it be on the hair, whether it be even on the dark, it literally obliterates that colour beneath it. However, if I use raw sienna, which is a transparent colour, but as I've mentioned before, of the same family, so here's raw sienna. Raw sienna will not put on the same area, you'll see it's like, almost like a glaze. You can see that colour and the, the tones beneath coming straight through. So raw sienna, say even right next to this raw, um, yellow ochre, if I put that on, it's almost like a glaze. So you can glaze with transparent colours. So if I was to mix yellow ochre on my palette, and I wanted to make it lighter and I had a little bit of Naples Yellow. Naples Yellow being an opaque colour and Yellow Ochre being an opaque colour, you'll see they will make a very, very strong opaque colour together. However, if I mix two transparent colours together, for instance, if I want to mix um, a transparent colour like Alizarin Crimson, and you can see how transparent it is, and I've put in, I've taken a little bit of French ultramarine, together that colour will remain transparent. So I can glaze in and you can still see the other colours underneath. Even though this is a very, very dark mix, it will basically still show the colours underneath will affect it. That is the difference between an opaque and a transparent colour. Transparent colours you can glaze with and it acts almost like as if you put a cellophane film over whatever you're showing underneath. I'll just go through one by one what is a warm, what is a cool, as I've gone through earlier, but what is a transparent and what's an opaque. So the alizarin crimson is a cool red and it's transparent. The cadmium red is a warm red and it's opaque. Scarlet, uh, cadmium scarlet is an opaque and of course it's very warm. The um, yellow ochre is a cool yellow and it is opaque. Cad yellow is a warm yellow, it's opaque. L Cad lemon yellow, it's opaque and it's, uh, it's, it's cool compared to Cad, lem Cad yellow, deep, but it is warm, of course, compared to yellow ochre. So therefore, um, depending on how you want to use it, it can be either a warm yellow or a cool yellow. Naples yellow is opaque and it is a considered can, can be considered a warm white. Uh, French ultramarine is a warm blue and it's transparent. Thalo turquoise is a cool blue and it's transparent. It's very strong. Both the, 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 the use of thalo turquoise will dominate uh, most of your other colours. Cerulean blue, uh, it's considered a uh, cool blue and it's opaque, uh, but it's quite weak. Um, this particular one, which is uh, a deep purple, it's um, ultramarine uh, purple and violet, and that's a transparent. And the cobalt violet is an opaque, but it's also very weak. So if you add a tiny bit of white to the cobalt violet, it will almost uh, obliterate the, the pigment in it. Cobalts and cadmiums are metal-based uh, pigments, and with the heavy metals, you find they happen to be a higher series, so they happen to be more expensive as well when you're talking about purchasing them in, in the synthetic um, uh, version. So, cobalt violet in this one, series six. I'm not sure how much that is in your currency, but it's quite expensive in Australian currency. Uh, and similarly, if you're looking at a CAD yellow, a CAD yellow um, is a Series 4 in most, whereas 
uh, alizarin crimson, which is a transparent pigment, that's only a series two. So it varies as well. So you'll, you'll find your, your metals having cobalts and cadmiums will be a lot more expensive. Terra Vert, it's pretty much transparent. You can glaze with it, but it's a weak uh, color. So you can, you'll find that it doesn't dominate, as I said, it doesn't dominate skin tone. So if I was to use, for instance, mix up a little bit of Terra Vert, and I've got my Naples yellow in this mix with the yellow ochre, so I take a little bit of that and that. You see how weak it is as far as a green goes. But it is quite opaque. So if I put that, it will obliterate the colour beneath, as you can see. And it's a, quite a cool green. Now, by the same token, if I was to use a sap green, being a transparent colour, if I put that across here, you can see the other colours right through it. And a sap green is a stronger colour, it's darker, but if I have a sap green with a tiny bit of maple jelly, you'll see how that really obliterates it, but it's quite, quite different here altogether. So when you're mixing a, um, a transparent colour with an opaque colour, it can turn quite opaque as you'll see here. So there was my sap green overlying the pigment beneath and it was like a transparent glaze. Here's sap green with a little bit of yellow ochre in it. Um, Naples yellow and yellow ochre in it. As soon as that Naples yellow and yellow ochre are mixed into it, it becomes opaque again. Moving on, you've got an emerald there and this is a beautiful colour to use. Um, it's a Windsor emerald and it's a cool green. Um, it hedges towards a, a bluish colour. When you're mixing a, this colour with um, a white or Naples yellow, you'll find that it loses a lot of its strength. So if I take a little bit of emerald, a little bit of white, straight away the white cools it down. And you can see how much cooler this is than, say, the sap green or the terra verde. It's a lot cooler, it's more towards blue. Whereas if you look at something like the cad green, which is opaque as well, you put that next to it, you can see how much warmer it is. So the emerald has got a bluish, it leans towards blue, and the cad green leans towards yellow. That will help you understand which colors therefore to use to bring something forward because warm colors bring things forward and cool colours take things back in space. If you were, for instance, to therefore use this in context of landscape, you would use the emerald green, you would add to your grass, if you're painting a, a field that would extend, say, a football field extending back in space for a couple of hundred metres, and you need to show that on a, on a um, canvas, you would use your warm greens on the grass in the foreground, and you would use your cool greens on the grass in the, in the background, which means it would therefore give it perspective and give it depth because the cool colors recede. Even though they're both green, you make the warm green come forward and the cool green would recede. Then we move on to our umbers and our browns. Raw umber. Raw umber is not exactly a brown. It can be used quite differently. If you mix a raw umber with a little bit of phthalo blue, and the phthalo blue, being a cool blue, strong blue, but it's very cool, and a raw umber being a cool colour, you'll find that together they make a very cool and great background colour. So you can see that if I add a tiny little bit of white even into it, it'll cool it down even further. Now putting that, assuming that we're taking this olive green as a warm compared to this, Watch what happens when you put this colour together. You can see how it drops back in space. So raw umber, although it's, it, it looks like it can be a brown, raw umber is actually more of a grey than anything else. And it can be used, if you're using, as far as what you're using, you can use it naturally for background colour, by mixing it around for background colour. But also, raw umber is the colour, when you're mixing it with a little bit of white and even a little bit of blue, as you can see there, it's the colour you would use for the whites of the eyes. 
when we're dealing with portraits. So that grey, blue, white mix is um, something is a colour that I want you to think about for you know putting them back into the portrait. And when you're creating whatever it is, whether it's a, a still life, a portrait, a landscape, whatever colour you put into the background, think about then incorporating that to unify the portrait or to unify the painting, I should say. Put some of the background colour back into the portrait. And if it's as much as a, just a tiny spot into the face, into the features, or into the foreground, um, you painting a field or into a landscape, uh, or even into a still life where you might use the raw umber again where it's on a turn of a fold of a, of a uh, napkin or into uh, the turning point in the cooling off of an area. You can you repeat whatever's in the background colour into the subject and into the foreground and that unifies the whole painting. Then we move into say the burnt umber. Now the burnt umber is much more of a brown. If you look at the burnt umber as far as the colour goes it's really a brown. And even adding a little bit of white to it, it stays a brown. You can see how different the, the burnt umber is when you add brown, when you add white to it to a raw umber. So the raw umber tends to be more of a, like a gray color. The burnt umber is warm. So raw umber, cool, having raw in it. Burnt umber, warm, the word burnt. Raw sienna will be a cool. Burnt sienna will be a warm. So looking at those two colors, Raw sienna, uh, you can use that, it's nice uh, sometimes as an underpainting as well, but look what happens when I add a little bit of white. It's very weak. So if you're thinking about adding white to something like raw sienna, yes, it'll make it opaque, whereas beforehand when I glazed it in, in its pure form, it was transparent. As soon as you add white to something, it'll become opaque and it'll cool it down even more. But you compare this particular raw sienna with white, compare that to yellow ochre and white. Here's a bit of yellow ochre, here's a bit of white. You can see now how yellow ochre and white, ye that yellow ochre is much warmer compared to that raw sienna and white. So that's a warmer compared to its, which looks like of the same family, the raw sienna, which is cool. And last of all, we've got burnt sienna. Now, burnt sienna, as the colour goes, it's a lovely um, colour that I use for underpainting. So, as you can see, it's a transparent colour. I think you can see that when I demonstrate it, if I glaze over it. So, a little bit of burnt sienna in glaze. You can see the pigments underneath it. It doesn't obliterate anything. However, you can see also that it would work, it has a lot of strength. So as far as a tonal range, how dark it can go, it's an important uh, pigment to use for underpainting. So either sketching out a portrait or um, underpainting a, a still life or a landscape, because it's got a strong tonal range, as does alizarin, but alizarin is probably a little bit too hot, um, uh, burnt sienna gives you the uh, full range almost of tones. It can be very, very dark, and so it has a strong staining ability as a dark, as you can see there. And it can also be watered down with uh, a little bit of um, turps, and, and it can be used as a very, very light glaze. So therefore, as an underpainting goes, burnt sienna is a very, very uh, good tool to use, both in landscape portraits and still life. Um, and I use it regularly for an underpainting because it's a, it, it's a, a colour that you can rub back on and it doesn't stain it like an opaque colour would. Um, these last two colours were ivory black. Ivory black is a warm black. Ivory, if you think of what ivory is, um, ivory is uh, not something we um, use uh, in our in our day to day uh, colours anymore very much because we I tend to make my own blacks. But if you can see, look at ivory black as a tone, it's very, very dark. Now that dark of ivory black still has a warmth in it, where something like Mars black is very, very much colder. I can match that tone of ivory black by pretty much mixing my own black, which in this case will be, as I demonstrated earlier, I can make it with an alizarin crimson 
and the uh, French ultramarine and almost match it. But this, what I've created is warmer. Because it's got a red in it and a little bit of blue, it's got like basically you're making a very, 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 very dark purple. It'll still uh, be a little bit warmer than the ivory black. Now, another way to warm up an ivory black is actually with your black, just go straight in and add a little bit of alizarin to it. And you'll see it becomes a warm black. So you can see how that's warm, warmer than that there. So that's quite cold. This is quite warm. And it's interesting that if you have a lot of area of black, you can create a life in your ivory black by just adding a little bit of a dark into it. Now, if, I'm, if I've got an area of black here, say, which is a large area and I want to cr create a little bit of life in that area, I would go ahead and put a streak, say, of French ultramarine and that will liven up a blue, a deep blue. You can see how that just livens up that black and makes it come much more alive than something which is left as a solid black colour. And that pretty much covers the whole palette of colours uh, that I have here as a demonstration between opaques and transparent colours. Titanium white is an opaque. Add titanium white to any of these pigments and it will become opaque. Um, you, can, you would scumble with, a, with an opaque colour, whereas you glaze with a transparent colour. You're basically doing the same thing, it's just a different difference in terminology. So if you wanted to create clouds on a blue sky, you would scumble in a transparent white, and that would create a lovely scumbled uh, cloud. Whereas if you put in, um, if you scumbled with a, a, a white that was a, an opaque, which is a titanium white, it would just obliterate the blue sky, so that wouldn't work very well. Similarly, if you're creating a love, if you want to create a depth in the shadows over here, or in, in any any of the shadow in the shadow areas, whether it be in a still life portrait or in a landscape, um, if you wanted to create a depth into it, you would glaze with a transparent color. You wouldn't put in a pear color because basically that would just um, change the whole depth of the color. Would look very very flat. That wraps up the palette then.